Good morning, First Presbyterian Church. I'm glad that you're here this morning. Again, Merry Christmas, and I hope you hear that a couple times this month. I am joined here by Alan and Olivia Reuter, and they're going to start us off today with our Advent. Go for it. Thank you, Chris. Last week, we lit the expectation candle, urging us to listen to God's prophets in His Word. Today, we light the preparation candle, urging us to prepare for the celebration of the birth of Jesus and His coming again. Isaiah 40, verse 3 to 5. A voice of one calling, In the desert prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the ragged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all mankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Luke 2, verses 1, then 3 to 7. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Whenever we're on mission with God, as Joseph and Mary were, while they waited for the birth of Jesus, we have to prepare. No one plants seeds one day and expects a harvest in the morning. There are things to do. Preparation is also a statement of faith, commitment to trust God even through challenges. Every detail of the Christmas story tells us that Mary and Joseph endured many trials as they waited for the arrival of Jesus. Mary left town. Joseph refused to reject her on the basis of an angelic dream. The neighbors probably gossiped about the scandalous events of Mary's pregnancy, and they had to travel to Bethlehem. But they prepared and trusted in God to be on a much greater mission than any carpenter's family could imagine. As we prepare for Christmas, may we keep Jesus' birth central in all our Christmas preparations. Let's pray together. Let's pray. Father God, help us to prepare for your coming. Keep us focused on what's really important. Open our eyes. Help us to trust you and help us to keep Christ at the center. Just as surely as he once came to Bethlehem, so surely he is coming again. Thank you for your intricate preparation in bringing Jesus to a lost and needy world. And thank you also for your plans to send him again. Thank you. In his precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Alan Olivia. So let us sing with joyful hearts as we tell the story, the wonderful story of Jesus coming. Would you please stand as we worship?
you just sang, say amen and amen. It's our custom to greet each other and welcome each other across the aisles, so please do that right now. Father, the early winter great cultural festival is upon us. Shopping and gifting fill our to-do lists. And the rush of the season leads us to make minor segments of life major, while the really important issues can become minor. It is only by conscious effort that we remind ourselves the most important gift has already been made. The gift of your only begotten Son is the greatest gift that we will ever receive with its wondrous continuing benefits. The Santa diversion confuses and distracts us. Let us be clear. Santa is a pagan element constructed to often soften the message of the angels, which was, unto you is born this day the Savior, Christ the Lord. Father, we confess we can become confused and distracted that we can muddy up the clarity of this important time when Jesus came to live among us, to lead us to you, to pay for our sins. Father, we ask for clarity of mind, for single commitment of heart. We confess unto you our sins. And we are encouraged that your word assures us that if we do that, that you forgive us and cleanse us. We present these requests in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
ourselves. Thank you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come before you and we thank you that as clear as those bells were, Lord, crystal clear, you hear our prayers. Lord, we know that you are with us, whether we be in this building or elsewhere. Lord, may we be reminded, even as those bells ring, whether it be on, we hear on TV or on radio or on the corner, Lord Jesus, may we be reminded that you hear us. And so, Lord, I bring before you our congregation, and Lord, we pray that you be with those who are still grieving and continue to grieve and remember those loved ones who have passed away in this time. Lord, it is hard. It is hard to think of them, of those fond memories, and yet knowing that this time and season is to bring such joy. Lord, may we lay those feelings and thoughts and of our hearts into your hands. And Lord Jesus, we pray, Lord Jesus, that you'd be the Washburn family as they mourn the loss of Margie's mom, Marilyn. Lord, we pray that you would bless that family, be their comfort, be their guide. Lord Jesus, that you would surround them with your church, that they would love and support them well. And Lord Jesus, we pray um, that you would move in our hearts that those who may, um, may need a home to connect with this holiday season who do not have family near, or family who has passed away, or kids, or family who is elsewhere in our, in our country. Lord, may our eyes and ears be open to connect with those who need a, a, warm, a warm meal to be with and to share laughter around our tables. Lord, move in our hearts. Oh, Lord Jesus, we pray. Um, we pray, Lord, that you would continue to help us to think clearly and to remember your story. Oh, Lord, we listen for you in your wisdom and your guidance. Thank you, Lord, for your love for us. In your name, amen. Good morning. My name is Megan Burgum, and I am the junior high director here, which is exciting. They're lots of fun. Um, I would like to uh, invite you to take a uh, connection card or a prayer request card. We love praying with and for you. And so if you could fill one of those out and put it in the offering plate. And if you have any new information for us, put it on the connection card so that we can be up to date because we like to connect with you. And there are uh, friendship pads on the ends of your aisles. So if you could grab one of those, jot down your name, keep passing it, and then pass it back. And if there's someone new to you, hopefully that will be a way to help you introduce yourself. A few things that are upcoming is we have the alternative um, gift fair happening, which is a way to give differently. You can turn your Christmas upside down by giving gifts that are meaningful and they're an investment in Christ's redeeming transformation of our city and world. And they come, uh, it's something for everyone from every continent. So check that out. And then we have our Christmas Eve services coming up, and there are three different options. The 4 p.m. one is a kid-friendly service with specific things for them, but more than anything, as we get ready for that time, I want you to think about who you may invite. I know for me, this is always a time when I look around at the people in my life who, one, may be transplants, maybe people who have moved here from elsewhere and don't really have family here and might feel a little lonely. And this might be a great opportunity to invite them into community here, right? And I also think of people who are on my volleyball team who I uh, love dearly but don't know Jesus. And this could be an opportunity for me to invite Brittany for the first time to come to church with me because uh, she is from out of town and doesn't have family here. So there are op options for us. Think about the people you sit next to at work or the people that uh, maybe relatives or people who don't know Jesus, that this might be an opportunity to share Christ with them.
And then finally, we have the pantry food box assembly happening. And uh, we, the purpose of these is to help some of our neighbors who have kids at home during the break who may not have um, food be able to feed their children. So everyone is invited to help assemble these boxes from 9 to noon on Saturday, December 15th. And then on Sunday, uh, the 16th, we're going to distribute the boxes to the neighbors from 1 to 4 p.m. and lunch is included. So if you would like to be involved with that, please come on December 15th and 16th. And as the ushers come forward, may we respond to God's goodness of the gift of Jesus through our offering.
Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, church. During this Advent season, when we remind ourselves about the waiting that was done for the Messiah to first arrive in Bethlehem, and the waiting that we do for the Messiah now to return, we're spending this month in the announcement texts of Isaiah, when the prophet points to the good work that God is going to do through the Messiah. And today's passage is in Isaiah chapter 40. And so I encourage you to find that in your Bibles. It's on page 1119, 1119 in your pew Bibles. It's a long passage. I'm going to read it in sections today. So I think it'll be important for you to keep your Bibles open throughout the sermon so that you can follow along in the best way. Isaiah chapter 40. 1,119 in your pew Bibles. Isaiah 40 is an interesting chapter because it's a message from God for the people who have gone into exile. And it's something that Isaiah, that God is anticipating uh, through the prophet Isaiah in the future. So Isaiah 40 is written for a people who are separated from their homeland and are experiencing the hardship and the suffering and the loss that goes along with that separation. And that's important not only because it helps us understand what in the world is happening in Isaiah 40, but it also helps us connect ourselves with the text. Because exile is, I think, an appropriate way for us to consider our lives in these times. If you are a believer in Jesus, according to the scripture, your true home is not here. It is where? Heaven. Heaven. The Apostle Paul says that our citizenship is in heaven. That is our home. And yet, God in his sovereignty has not taken us there yet. And so we are called to live here as citizens of there. And things here are not as they will be there. And that makes the waiting here even more difficult. So we can identify with people who are in exile, who are far from away from home and are waiting to return home. Is anybody here, is there anybody here who just loves waiting? (laughs) Anyone who loves to wait their turn at the DMV? Anyone who loves to stand in line while Christmas shopping? Anyone who loves waiting in traffic for the accident to clear? Anyone who loves waiting for that friend to pick you up who is running late? Anyone who loves waiting on the phone for the next available customer service agent? (laughs) I spoke with a member of our church this week who was on hold for two hours waiting for the next available customer service agent and then the office closed and his call ended. That's like a waiting nightmare come true. (laughs) You see, I think it's very rare for any of us to love waiting because I think that especially the more that we're used to being able to get things done ourselves, the more we hate waiting. Because often waiting is connected with things being out of our own control. And many of us hate when things seem out of our own control. And yet today's passage, today's announcement from Isaiah is one of the most famous passages in the Bible about waiting. And if we can learn to do the waiting described in Isaiah 40, especially if we can learn to even love the waiting that's described in this passage, instead of waiting bringing us frustration and fatigue and apathy, waiting will bring comfort 
and strength and healing. That's the kind of transformation that God can bring in our lives today if we open ourselves up to the work of His Spirit. So would you join me as we pray together and ask God to have His way in our time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your presence here among us today as we worship together you, our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We pray that you would now speak to us through your word. God, we are so thankful for your word. Thank you for the way that you speak to us and change us through it by your spirit. And so now open up our hearts and our lives, every single one here, whether we feel close to you today or whether we feel really far today, I pray that you would open up our lives to hear your voice, that we wouldn't just hear interesting information, but God, that we would experience your redeeming transformation. For your kingdom to come, for your will to be done, we ask it in Jesus' precious and holy name. And everyone who agreed said, Amen. 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 Isaiah 40, verses 1 through 9. Hear now God's holy and awesome word to his people. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling, in the desert prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out, and I said, what shall I cry? All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. You who bring good tidings to Zion, go up on a mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, hear is your God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One of the things I love about this passage is that right away we learn something about the character of God, about who God is. The the same God who disciplines his people to train them up in righteousness is also deeply concerned about comforting his people. Comfort, comfort, said twice, so to have extra emphasis. God says, comfort my people. God wants the prophet to bring a comforting word to his people. And if you read Isaiah as a whole, you know that not every word in Isaiah is a comforting word. But Isaiah 40 is meant to bring comfort. And so in this chapter, we see the the love of God. We, We see the care of God. We see the compassion of God. It's out of that love and care and compassion that his healing word comes. God commands the prophet to speak tenderly to Jerusalem and give her this important message, a message of comfort. And so what is that message of comfort? Well, I think it has kind of two main parts. The first is found right here in verse 2, and then the second in the following verses. So first, at the end of verse 2, it says, God says, that tell her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. This is God saying to the exiles, the exile is ending. The rebellion that caused your exile has been paid for and you are receiving an incredible blessing from the Lord that far exceeds your sin against the Lord. God in his awesome grace is going to bring relief from their exile. He's going to bring healing from their suffering. God hasn't forgotten them. God hasn't dismissed them. God hasn't condemned them. Instead, he's redeeming them. He's freeing them He's restoring them. He's healing them. That's the first part of this comforting word of God for his people. The hard service has been completed. And then the second part in verse 3 is an announcement of God's intervention. It's an announcement 
of God's arrival, of His advent. Prepare the way for the Lord. And why would you prepare a way? Because the Lord is coming. God Himself is going to intervene. So in God's sovereign grace, a way is being made. And the picture here is of the incredibly rugged terrain of the wilderness that's around Jerusalem. And it's a picture of those valleys being raised and those mountains being lowered and that rough ground being leveled and rugged land being made plain. That's what God was going to do because the glory of the Lord, he says, will be revealed in such a way that all people will see it together. And it's important for us to remember that in the mind of a person in exile, the glory of the Lord often seems distant. The glory of the Lord often seems small or unseen or non-existent. We can experience the same thing when we watch the news or read the newspaper or think about some of the things that are happening in the life of our world. But, but this prophecy is good news and it's comforting because God is speaking right into that very reality, that reality which often can feel like our reality. And he's saying, I am going to show up. I'm going to reveal my glory in a way that Everybody understands. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken, he says. And, and God's word doesn't fade. And God's word doesn't wither. No, the word of our God endures forever. In other words, God is saying, what I promise will indeed come true. So proclaim the good news and proclaim it without any fear. Be, Behold, this is your God because the Lord is coming in a way that everyone will recognize. Hallelujah. And beloved, if that message doesn't fire you up at, at least a little bit this morning, then you might be sleeping because this text announces the awesome work of God to bring his kingdom of wholeness into fruition. This is God's promise of restoration from, from all the woundedness of exile. And ultimately, this is the promise God fulfills in Jesus Christ. And if we're not moved by it, then perhaps it's because our eyes have not been opened to the reality of our desperate need for it. None of us can truly pay for our sins None of us deserves the blessing of God. None of us can secure our own ultimate freedom. But God in His grace promises here in Isaiah 40 that He will do those things for the people who put their trust in Him. This Isaiah 40 is a promise of glorious hope for the people of God. And just in case you were wondering if God is powerful enough to do such a transformational work, just look at the verses that follow. These, these verses are meant to remind every listener that God is absolutely and completely worthy of our trust. Look at verses 10 through 26. And just hear this truth about our God. See, the, the sovereign Lord comes with power and His arm rules for Him. See, His reward is with Him and His recompense accompanies Him. He tends His flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in His arms. He carries them close to His heart. He gently leads those who have young. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of His hand or with the breadth of His hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? Who has understood the mind of the Lord or instructed him as his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him and who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? Surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Lebanon is not sufficient for altar fires, nor is animals enough for burnt offerings. Before him, all the nations are as nothing. They are regarded by him as worthless and less than nothing. To whom then will you compare God? What image will you compare him to? As for an idol, a craftsman casts it. 
and goldsmith overlays it with gold and fashions it with silver chains for it. A man too poor to present such an offering selects wood that will not rot. He looks for a skilled craftsman simply to set up an idol that will not topple. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither and a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Wow. I don't have time this morning to to mine the depths of all those words, but let me just highlight what the ESV study Bible outlines, that these verses show God's unmatched power, his unmatched wisdom, his unmatched immensity, his unmatched sovereignty, and his unmatched authority. We, church, can trust God to do everything that he says he will do because of who he is. Who is like him? No one. And so the prophet comes back to the people with this question found in verse 27. He says, Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. In other words, Israel, why are you acting as if God has forgotten you? Verse 28. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired and weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. So not only is God unmatched in his power and wisdom and immensity and sovereignty and authority, but he also does not grow tired of his covenant. He does not forget his covenant. He doesn't wear out. He doesn't burn out. And he's in the habit of giving strength to the weary and power to the weak. And to that end, the prophet concludes with these words of exhortation. He says, even youths grow tired and weary and young men will stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Hallelujah. Isaiah 40 is primarily a proclamation of what God is going to do, but but here it's not just proclamation. Here it's also exhortation. Here here is the, the so what of this passage. These last verses give us the application of all that we've heard before. God has announced comfort for his people in the midst of their hardship. He has announced that their exile will end and that the glory of the Lord will be revealed. Because of who God is, we can trust that he will do what he says he will do. Therefore, these final verses call us to wait upon the Lord, to hope in the Lord. And when we do, he will give us strength. Church, during this Advent season, we remember the waiting that God's people did for their Messiah. And we celebrate the end of that Advent, that the Messiah, at the end of Advent, that the Messiah did indeed come. God always fulfills his promises. Jesus was given as the promised child born to us, the Savior of the world, the Redeemer, the Restorer, the Healer has come. And he has initiated this kingdom of wholeness by demonstrating with his life what the kingdom of God is like, by 
by making the way for us to participate in his kingdom as he submitted himself to death on the cross and paid the price for our sin and by rising from the dead in forever victory over sin and death. And just like this prophecy declares for all those who put their faith in Jesus for salvation, he gives a double portion of blessing, not just to be saved from sin's deathly effects, but also to be saved for life in his kingdom of wholeness. And so if you're a person today who hasn't yet put your faith in Jesus, then I, I pray that today your eyes will be open to the incredible gift that God has for you this Christmas, when you simply humble yourself and believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. But church, Advent isn't only for remembering what it was like back then to wait for Jesus to come. Advent is also to remind us that we are also waiting. We live in a very unique time in the history of the world. We live in the time between when Jesus inaugurated his kingdom with his life, death, resurrection, ascension, and the sending of the Spirit, and the time when Jesus will come again to make everything right, to make bring everything under his lordship for the full manifestation of his kingdom. We live in the in-between. And so we are also waiting. We are also anticipating. And waiting is hard. Because the world is not as it should be. And our city is not as it should be. And even our congregation is not yet as it's fully meant to be. And waiting for that is hard. It's hard because waiting means that we still have to be in the hardship. We still have to be in the world where there is violence, where harm is done. We still have to live in the reality of brokenness and woundedness. So what are we to do? Beloved, hear the word of comfort. May our hearts be open to hear comfort. Comfort from your God who is all-powerful and everlasting and unrivaled and who loves you and cares for you and holds you close to his heart. And his message of comfort is this. The healer has come. He has paid for your sins. He will bring an end to your hardship. But until that end, in, in all its fullness, until that end comes, If you are waiting on the Lord, in other words, if you are hoping in the Lord, or if you are trusting in the Lord, or if you are submitting your everyday life to Him, if you are depending on Him, if you are looking to Him and to Him alone, He will give you His strength. That's that's what it means there. Not just that He will kindle the strength that's in you, that you had in yourself already, no. But He will give you strength from His everlasting source of strength. Not just so that you can get by. No, it paints a much brighter picture than that. Not just that you can survive, but but so that in Christ you can soar on wings like eagles, that you can run, that you can walk and keep walking and keep moving forward, no matter how arrogant you have been. No matter how many burdens you carry, no matter what has happened to you, no matter how you have failed. When we are waiting upon the Lord, He will give us strength to keep waiting until His glory is revealed. Church, that is the only way that we can be who God has called us to be and to do what God has called us to do until His kingdom of wholeness fully comes. And so may we, this week, may we humble ourselves. May we confess our need for His strength. 
And may we wait only upon the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have not forgotten us, that you are the everlasting God. We give you praise and thanksgiving for your incredible work that you've done in Jesus and that you will do. And we can know that you will do it because the mouth of the Lord has spoken and the word of the Lord stands forever. Help us to trust in you. Help us to wait in you, even in the midst of, especially in the midst of hardship. Help us to trust in you, knowing that as we do that, God, you give us strength. Not to just sit and do nothing, but to participate in your kingdom coming. To be the people that you call us to be, the congregation that you call us to be. Remind us this week of our need to wait on you. And the great promise that when we do, you will give us strength. And may your people find that comforting this week. So that we would soar like eagles and run and walk without growing faint or tired. We ask in Jesus' name. And everyone who agreed said, Amen. 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 Well, church, it is our privilege now to invite new members into the life of our congregation. I'd love for all the new members to begin making their way up here and uh, come on up and join me right up here on the chancel. Uh, While they're coming, let me just introduce them to you. We have some pictures. So first we have Arlene Baker. We don't have a picture of everybody, but I'll point them out. Arlene Baker, her husband, Gene Baker, um, Chuck Halstead. Come on up, guys, right up here. Um, Gerard Brumfield, Leslie Dow, Fred Dow, Michael Wetke, Marsha Gilbert, Paul Braswell, Roxanne Braswell, Nate Turner, doesn't look like everybody's here first thing this morning, that's okay, Brianna Turner, Amelia Sanders, Suzanne Kimball, Mary Frances Autry, and Daniel Autry. So, welcome new members. So glad you're here. I have some questions for you first. All right? So, do you acknowledge yourselves to be sinners in the sight of God and without hope for your salvation except in His sovereign mercy? Do you? Yes. And do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and the Savior of sinners? And do you receive and depend upon Him alone for your salvation as He is offered in the gospel? Do you? And do you now promise and resolve in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as becomes the followers of Christ? Do you? Yes. And do you promise to serve Christ in His church by supporting and participating with this congregation in its service of God and its ministry to others to the best of your ability? Do you? Yes. And finally, do you submit yourself to the government and discipline of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church and to the spiritual oversight of this church's session? And do you promise to promote the unity, purity, and peace of the church? Do you? Yes. Wonderful. We have the great privilege of today of having a baptism. Everyone has been baptized here except Arlene. So Arlene, would you come on over right over here, my friend? And um, you can, yep, Gene will hold those glasses right there. Will you come and just kneel right here? Arlene, you have now... Do you have an answer to your faith in Jesus Christ? Do you desire to be baptized as a follower of Jesus who belongs to him? Yes. Yes. All right. Arlene Baker, my sister in Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. May you, Arlene, forever know God's incredible love and grace and call on your life. May you follow him always. May his glory be revealed in and through you for his kingdom to come and his will to be done as now a daughter of the king. We ask in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And everyone who agreed said? Amen. 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 Arlene, you may.
<laughs> Would the members kind of stand up here, come up close, a little closer to the front? Congregation, while you look at these new members, you can hold on to that if you want, Arlene. Um, so, um, As you look at these new members, let me ask you an important question. Will you, the members of this congregation, along with these members, will you now accept and receive these members? Will you take responsibility to walk with them and work with them in the purposes that God has given us as a church, that we together may engage together in Christ's work of making disciples for the redeeming transformation of our city and our world? Will you? Amen. Amen. And now, inasmuch as you have made your profession of faith, my friends, Having been baptized and having been approved for, by the church session for active membership, I declare that you are entitled to all the privileges of this congregation and the full fellowship of the church, as well as having all the duties and responsibilities incumbent upon those who profess Christ and seek to worship God by service to Him and ministry to others. In other words, congratulations, you are members of the church. Will you welcome them? Uh, elders, any elders that are here to come up and lay hands on these members? Gene, if you need to lean back on this thing, you can right here if you want to kind of lean. That'll hold you up. So elders, would you please come forward? New members, would you kind of step forward down to the step so that they can come and surround you and kind of just spread out? And then I'm going to pray. We're going to pray for them. And then um, we're going to just have them stay right here for the benediction. And church, would you join me as we pray for these new members? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so very much for these new members, for their faith in you, for their baptism, for their story of redemption and salvation, and for their desire to be a part of what you're doing in this and through this congregation. Bless them and encourage them now as members. Help them to live into the vows that they have just spoken by the strength of your spirit. Help them to wait on you and on you alone so that you will renew their strength, that you will give them hope and love and energy to live as members of this congregation, that we together might pursue the purposes and the ends that you have for us. We pray your blessing upon them now, and we pray together as one body in great unity the prayer that Jesus taught the disciples, praying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would everybody stand with us and you guys can just stay right where you are. I invite you now, the prayer team is here and they would love to pray with anyone who has any need for prayer this morning. Please feel free to come forward and pray with them. And now I invite you to receive this blessing from the Lord as you go out from this place. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his perfect peace today and every day. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Congratulations. Way to go, my friend.